Welcome back, everybody. It's Woody Beardsley here with my friend Matt Troop, creator, originator, the man who originally got me interested in real estate. How you doing, Matt? Well, that was a, that was a good introduction. I'm, I'm doing good. Been watching a lot of hot ones lately. <laughs> I'm, I'm Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting some more coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's good to uh, good to be with here with my my good buddy, my partner. We'll tell him where we are. Woody Beardsley. So. We are, this is, this is uh, the first week in October, and we are up in Calumet, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and we are, it's good, it'll be a good, good mastermind weekend. I was thinking about that last night, and I was like, you ever, you know how you meet up with people, and it's like, you go to a conference, and it's almost like the immersion of the experience, it kind of like broadens your understanding of something, like you go to an event. And you're with people and like you're kicking ideas around, but then when you go out and you go and do something into the world, it's like that, that experience that those ideas that you, that you come up with are like compounded. And I was thinking about that. So we get to go mountain biking today. Up oh, Copper yeah. Harbor. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty stoked for that. So like even like, and it was even like last night as we were talking, we got into some really good conversations last night and, and I, and I was thinking about this, it's. Have you been, um, and for those people out there, you probably got those like good friends, those partners, and you've probably heard the phrase that like, there's people that you can spend a minute with, there's people you can spend 10 minutes with, an hour with, and then like days with. And it, it's like, I feel like we have that, well, like how often do we talk on the phone? Pretty frequently. I think, yeah, yeah there'll be times that we'll just call each other probably talk sometimes a minute sometimes 20 minutes yeah every day but it's like just like about. every it's like every day and like from a business partner standpoint and then when you get together it's like it just it just starts flowing and and you get into like good conversations and that's what like that's what we had last night right so we have to spend like how many days together like yeah when are you leaving sunday sunday okay so we could spend like today is friday friday morning friday yeah. got here yesterday yeah um, I should also say that right now we are um, in a house that Matt just bought recently, and they are redoing the roof. So if you hear pounding, or just you know a loud thud, so real estate investors do. Yeah, we have roof projects going on in the background and scaffolding outside your windows. And <laughs> I know a lot of times, like a lot of people complain about uh, the price of our rental properties and just say they're not realistic. Like, you know, we're paying 25,000 unit, but Matt, how much did you buy this house for? So 40,000 bucks. 40,000 bucks. Yeah. Like, so 40,000 and, right, okay, so like how much do you say, how much do you think of all, okay, so we should go back a little bit. So Woodward and I are in a business partnership together and we have seven units together in a partnership. But then I have, I've got another partnership where I've got um, 13 more units and I've got two units of my own real estate investment. What do you have besides ours? With then I have a, a three unit on my own and then I also bought another eight unit um, with my friend Matt True, or not Matt True, Matt Goten. And then I also manage uh, another 14 units on top of that. So... All in all, I have my fingers in 32 prop, 32 units. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah, so... They keep me busy. So how, like, when we... How much did you did you pay for your triplex that you had? 78,000 bucks. That was the most I ever spent. 26,000 per unit. Yeah. So, I mean, in, like, in relation to stuff like that... I think that's pretty pretty normal. I mean, if you want to make money in real estate, and that's, you know, the biggest thing is... Ooh, like with, New people, well, anyone can analyze a deal, but they'll see it and they're like, they'll see a 20% return, but then it's kind of a crap in, crap out thing mm -hmm. because it, you know, our properties, you know, we were projecting a 50% return on money and, but you know, repairs come up, vacancy comes up, this mm -hmm. comes up, you know, like, well, it might be closer to, you know, 40, 30. So what do you mean by like the 20% return? Just because there's so many people that, like that kid Jack I was telling you about last night, he bought that duplex around the street from us. So he spent $86,000 on. Yeah. He's like, well, it's 15% cash on cash return. 
you know, once I figured this and that yeah. in, and then he is losing his ass. Yeah. Like he had spent twenty five hundred dollars on fixing the boiler because he didn't have anybody come and look at the boiler, right. and he bought it in the summer, and then he had spent twenty thousand bucks to do the boiler. Twenty five hundred or twenty five hundred, but yeah. still like right out of the gate. I was like, dude, I would have thrown a furnace in there. Yeah, you know, it's like, and the guy, oh, by the way, his boiler still doesn't work. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> going down there. like they're like, hey, it's getting cold again. The boiler still isn't working, and then he's like, I just spent twenty five hundred dollars this spring to get it fixed, and and it's still not working. Like, did he get a hole? Did he get yeah, a hole? Yeah, the guy who did it, and I don't know if, what the deal is there, but it sounds like the guy might come back out. But mm-hmm. this is like the third time that same guy coming back out, and they're not difficult machines. That's yeah. why, like, but I went down there and looked at it. He's got a lot of goofy stuff wired up a little pretty goofy yeah. I mean I can usually figure out like look at a wiring diagram and I'm like okay this tells us to turn on turn off this controls this this controls that and you're like alright and then you can start poking prod and stuff to figure out what's working what's not but okay so you just talked about like yeah I covered you, a lot of subjects there yeah okay but, right so yeah. like we, we can get into that like but anyway about... so we'll touch on the cash on cash return yeah it's like you need to see you like best case scenario say 50 to 60 percent return on your money assuming no management no maintenance no nothing like if you only made your mandatory payments of utilities taxes and debt payments Mm -hmm. and you know piti you should see a 50 percent return on your money but you're not going to see that in your pocket just because your things are going to come up but most people say like okay well i'll try and budget for 200 bucks a month well, guess what? Your first year, you're going to have a three thousand dollar bill at some point, yeah, and that's going to eat up your profit for oh, you know, years, yeah, and and well, that's dude, why you need that astronomical return number, yeah. Otherwise, it's not a good deal because I feel like the way we're making, we're like, yeah, they're not bad, they're worth it, right? But if they were any worse, you know, I probably want to call it quits at some point, yeah, yeah. And I mean, like that's I think going into like that's a little bit of the mindset kind of going into this stuff. Yeah. Right, like I and I think a lot of people we kinda we kinda were actually talking about this yesterday is people get into the real estate game or investment game and they kind of it's like they kind you know, sometimes you have blinders on. And I think, you know, from what you and I talked about, like you think about our experience with this, like both of us went to engineering school and I mean, you know, just kind of like like that's like it's like a persona that we both have where we mm-hmm. sit here and we're like system oriented process oriented but what we've done like we got into real estate well i got into it what two years ago and then we both got into it pretty much like what two years ago well you bought that greeley property in yeah. colorado and then you got like the triplex was like like a couple yeah. months after that it was in april of 2018 dude so like it's that is slippery slope <laughs> first bought my first property in april of last year and now I got you got you're into like own, 32 units own 18 of them I have yeah. a finger my fingers in 18 of them yeah and the ownership lies and manage like 14 so yeah dude like that's impressive and even and like the thing is like i feel like everything we do yeah we just i don't know we're both very addictive people i mm-hmm, think mm-hmm. and i think that's a, can be a great personality trait and a bad personality trait because no. i mean it's like in college if i was drinking i was drinking seven days a week you know because like whatever i'm doing i'm doing 100 mm-hmm. percent. and now it's like real estate it's like right, i'm doing this i'm doing it 100 yeah. it yeah. is it's it's totally addicting yeah and you just gotta you just roll with it go you know in as fast as you can but i guess a little background the way matt and i know each other is we um both went to michigan tech together and we met playing basketball my freshman year is second freshman year <laughs> That's, so that's about that's six years of, older that, than me. That's a five funny story. We what? We've known each other what for ten years, like ten years now. Yeah, because it was well, it was, it was probably ten and a half years. Yeah, it was because it was two thousand eight, fall two thousand eight. So I went there and it was the second semester, so two thousand yeah, nine. Yeah, June two thousand nine, somewhere around there. Yeah. And then after the next year, we started lifting together. Yeah, and it's like, hey, you want to lift? Seriously, <laughs> you want to lift weights for real? <laughs> None of this yeah. horsing around stuff. Right, and it goes back into that like. Dude, like that. And then we both like funny. we went, dude. We went like six days a week. You yeah, know, hour like, and a half like a day. Addictive like, things. Yeah, like balls to the wall. Yeah, like lifting hard. 
Well, that's kind of funny. So it's almost like, like if you think about that, right? So we went, we turned it, we we started lifting weights together and working Mm -hmm. out together, which then it kind of morphed into like, we started talking about, like we moved away from each other and then it kind of morphed into something else for you because we started getting into investing and we started, and that's so funny. Like think about the things that have morphed over time. We got into stock investing. Oh yeah. We're obsessed with trading stocks. Yeah. we got. By the way. Yeah. That's another... (laughs) You can like you can make money from it, but like no, it's no, dude, not you real have money. To, no, it's like, all play money. It's all like the Wolf Wall Street. Yeah, Fugazi, Fugazi. It's all. <laughs> yeah. So it's morphed into that. Then now it's like morphed into real estate. And so okay, dude, I was thinking about this the other day, and it's kind of you seen the movie Blow, right? Oh yeah. So you remember the part on Blow? I think about that a lot. Like with as I've gotten into real estate and investing, and it's there's a part where he's in prison, and. Uh, maybe it's a bad analogy, but it's it's a good analogy. Sounds because, like a good one. Yeah. He gets he's in prison. He's talking to Diego, and he gets in prison for selling marijuana. But then Diego is like, I think you had the wrong vision or wrong dream, and that's when he gets into cocaine. And it, I mean, granted, cocaine's illegal. I mean, real estate is a very legal and very beneficial way to build wealth and build investing. But he gets into that into into selling cocaine, and it just blows up for him. Right and li- okay. like I think I feel like that. You know, bachelor's like, in cocaine, and a master's in mar- or bachelor's in marijuana. A PhD, uh, yeah, yeah, like a bachelor's in marijuana, a PhD in cocaine. Yeah, and like I feel like that is almost like what's happened over the past two years, as we've turned like this, like what you're saying, like this kind of addictive personality from lifting weights to investing money, and we had an idea of of investing money. Now it's kind of broadened and we're just getting like, just immersing ourselves in this topic of real estate investing and just investing as a whole, yeah. figuring out ways how to just grow wealth and grow money. Yeah, it's like a learning curve thing too. Like sometimes mm-hmm. people get in, people have told me that I'm, I'm annoyingly good at everything I do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it's because you go so hard into it when you're starting out, you get through the sucking phase of the learning curve real yeah. fast. And that's the biggest, most important thing is like, it's like then once you get past that sucking phase, then you can actually start doing well. The sucking phase. <laughs> the sucking phase where you, where you're basically struggling. Yeah, it's like, it, it's, I don't know. You've seen like those graphs of like effort in, time, and or skill and time. Yeah. And then it's like you're putting in time and you're still sucking, 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 sucking. And then like you start, all of a sudden you start learning really fast and that's the fun stage. Yeah. And then, then it takes another 2000 hours to master that. And then, but you, it's yeah. like my, my goal and everything is to get to there. Yeah. And whatever I do, because you will have 80% of what you need, yeah. but then in the extra 20% mastering, whatever it is, like there's going to be times like where, yeah, I mean, working on stuff, you know, electrical plumbing, all that stuff, I just try to get through that, that struggling phase. So that kind of goes into, and it's like, it's kind of funny to see like our different kind of like brain patterns. I guess thought patterns, I get, I nerd out on this stuff, like kind of ideas as we get into this. Like, do you think, so you're talking about like going on that graph and I, like you do, you go along and you get, you almost like plateau. Mm-hmm. Like what happens, what happens when you plateau and you know, we, we could like, I feel like you could, equate that to real estate to like real estate investing when were the times like you think you've like plateaued and then and then were the were the times you were on the upslope i mean there's times like where i remember going back home and talking to bob gale and this guy evergreen Mm -hmm. and if you think you're mastered at something and you're not a multi multi multi-millionaire yeah you're just the smartest guy in the room you need to change rooms exactly yeah and I remember talking to Growth Iger Green, Iger Green, and he was uh, he was just like saying how he's like, well, I, the city tried to make me do this and do that. And I was like, but legally I knew they couldn't, so then I, you know, basically like held him over the fire. And he ended up getting uh, um, somebody gave him a piece of property to pay off a debt that he basically made up. It's like, hey, you're using my property to get access to your boat dock. Yeah. And he's like, I'm charging you this much, and if you don't want to, and it was like a commercial thing on that dock. Yeah. So they uh. So he ended up, you know, closing it down until you pay, pay him. So they ended up just giving him another piece of property, which was waterfront on the island. And then he turned around and sold that for a million bucks. He's like, they owed him $150,000 in, in, you know, debt that he basically wanted them to 
pay. Yeah. And then they just gave him his property because they didn't have cash, but they had property. So he got a property. So yeah, yeah. Then he turned around and sold that to Bob Gale. Yeah. And it was probably he sold to him for actually seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then Bob Gale took that and made it turn into like six condos. Yeah. And now he's selling each one for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Dude, like. That. And then so it's like it, 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 there's just like so many things that everyone has such a unique story about like this and that their home runs. Yeah. You realize that. Yeah, we might be doing good buying, you know, buying apartments in the ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's times like when you're leveling up and you're playing with more money, you got to know every angle possible and you don't even know what you don't know. So, okay. So I want to give some like perspective to that story. So Woody is from Mackinac Island, Michigan. That was another funny story when we first yeah. met. And yeah. I was like, where are you from? Mackinac Island. And you were, I was like, no, no, you're not. And then yeah. come to find out you really were. So he grew up in Mackinac Island. And so on Mackinac Island that stuff that you're talking about, real estate is, I mean, it's, you can make a lot, I mean, real estate on Mackinac Island is. Still a lot of good deals. Everyone told me that there's still great deals on the island, except yeah. they have an extra zero or two. In <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of like boardwalk and yeah. park place type yeah. of property. It, yeah, it really so, is. So that, okay, so that situation where you went to Mackinac Island, you were talking to those mentors from that, um, from that place. And you, you talked about, you know, talking to Bob, talking to Ira, right? Yep. So, like, what were, what do you think, like, you talking about leveling up, like, what were the lessons, like, that you kind of took away from that situation, that story that he did? I mean, I think there's definitely a stage where, like, right now, we could just keep buying apartments, keep buying apartments, mm -hmm. but there's got to be a point where, you know you're not going to be able to be in control, like the whole idea of like having 300 units and then hiring a property manager. And then you're not in control of your investment at that point if you mm -hmm. have a property manager because like I said, you know, they might hire people for dumb stuff and then you start might start bleeding money. And then it might take a year or two to realize that you're like, hey, my return has gone down 30% yeah. because this property manager isn't taking care of the little nickel and dime stuff. Right. And, uh, and I think that's where these guys, they started out doing what we're doing. Yeah, and doos, then doos. but then they found out how to level up and how to still be involved in, and still keep their portfolio small, but strong. You know, they, like, the the dollar value grows, but then the amount of things you have to worry about doesn't necessarily go up as much as as well too. Yeah, and I mean I think that is like that's like where I like the idea of taking on more and more debt is for higher higher dollar things, not necessarily more and more of the same thing. So, okay, explain that. Explain that. Just because, I, I mean, if we're going to keep... I was thinking about this yesterday, or not yesterday, but probably a week or two ago. I was like, you know, once maybe $10,000, $10, $20,000 a month going out in debt payments. Mm -hmm. I was like, I think that might be the time. Because right now, it's probably around 5000 mm -hmm. or In what? In PIT? 3000 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all that going out in like three three thousand three five hundred dollars a month. I was like, well, maybe when that gets to ten dollars $20,000, maybe I'll start looking to pay things off. Yeah. Because then it'd be the return on getting rid of those payments is there right i was like or you know you level up and you you rather than you know just have a bunch of apartments that you're trying to pay off one by one maybe you sell off a chunk and yeah. then level up to one big thing rather than have a you know and this is this kind of gets in top of what we were talking about last night where you were saying and i mean i really i really like this idea how you talked about you know right you've got this portfolio of buildings and I like I really like how you said okay so maybe you focus on like one building where you're like okay over the next few years we're just gonna just pay a ton just, off yep. and then and then that thing is just gonna be get paid off and then it's just gonna be mat like massive cash flow coming in and then you kind of you know maybe take a month or two break or maybe like a six month break and then you're like okay now I'm gonna focus on paying this building off like mm -hmm. build up some reserves and then do that again yeah. And then it's just, it's like compounding after that. And the, I will say, it seems like everyone who survived the economic crisis, their mindset at In some like point. In like 2008, was, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like, they, they, their whole goal at some point was to pay off their debts. Right. But people who also were highly leveraged on bigger things still did fine too. But the thing is, the people who were highly leveraged on lots and lots of things yeah. were the ones that... Cause they couldn't eat it. Yeah. But. And that, that's even like, if you like, I don't know. I mean, I think about this with the properties that I have is you have to, you got to kind of know, you got to kind of know the situation you're in. 
And and I look at it, and to me, it was, you know, we got into this conversation again last night about like A class properties, B class, C class properties. And I mean, man, that's a whole other topic. Another topic we can do is like A class, B class. But I mean, the large majority of our properties are what? They're probably like C class investments. A solid C. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about the, I've talked to so many people, and I feel like they've said that, they've reiterated that same point. Like during the crash, during those times of recession that it's like the C class properties that it's that people will always need. And that's, I mean, that's a great theory of real estate is people always need places to live, but those C class properties are ones that are kind of like definitely in that middle. I mean, they're not, they're not your $1,600 a month rent payments. They're, you know, your five, six, $700 a month rent payments. Those type of people, just say those type of people, but like, what do you mean those people? <laughs> <laughs> but people will always need those type of places, and there's always like those specific jobs that can get, that can get, um, they can afford those type of places. And it doesn't matter like yeah. what type of market you're in. <clears throat> yeah, just so that, people know, like our all of our apartments, all the ones I own, like all the ones that you're involved with too. Yeah. What's the most expensive rent that you have for not counting your duplex Minneapolis? Yeah, so yeah, the duplex. Every, in everything else was like nice, but I live seven hundred and fifteen bucks. Seven yeah. is like the most expensive one we have, and the like cheapest one is. Well, I guess I got one that for four hundred. Yeah, I mean, where's the, ours? Ours that are the same range. Yeah, one. yeah. The the highest one that we've got is in Bay City, and I think it's seven hundred. And the lowest one we have, I think, it's like four twenty five. But yeah. I mean, it's, it's okay, but every, everyone can afford those. Hey, we got a lot going on here with kids and and dogs and puppies and uh, and roof re roofing projects. It's uh, um, this is right. It's kind of like what real estate investing is about. This is exactly. the life you get. <laughs> laughing about laughing about losses. No, um, but to touch back on the paying off debt and whatnot. Mm-hmm. The guy that we bought the eight unit from, his whole business model was buy a whole bunch, just buy like three, four properties every year. And whatever money that makes, that you just keep paying off properties with the money all those properties make. But the way he made his living was he would flip four houses a year, three houses a year. Yeah. And then so he, he did, he, I mean, he obviously took some money from his rentals to be able to afford to flip properties like that. Right. But he was basically taking these, so he was living off the flips, and then then he was paying off those. He said, so the first 10 years, he lived like a pauper. Yeah. You know, and then after that, he's like, it was, he goes, now that I've lived long enough, it's worth it. He goes, but if I died young, it wouldn't have been worth it. Yeah. You know, but I was <laughs> you, like, it was fun. Play. I was staying busy. He goes, yeah. yeah. He's like, I like staying busy. He's like, I still, he was 70 something years old. And he's just like, well, I still go down there to work. I still paint. I still do this and do that. How many guys do you come across in their 60s and 70s that are doing that? I, I feel, I mean. Not many. I feel like it's, it's quite a few. I feel like in this game, there's like. Oh yeah. I mean like in this, in the real estate world. Yeah. yeah. In this game, but. Like that's the thing almost that kind of motivates me. And again, I, I don't know, I always fall back to this stuff about mindset and how like with this, <clears throat> like I, I can get into the story a little bit of like what I've done and, and how I'm living off of this real estate with my lifestyle now. And it's the same type of thing. Like I've cut my expenses so much I'm living off, like living off the passive income from my rentals and consulting businesses that I've started up. But what I've realized is that it's it's a long game that you play. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah you constantly have to have that in the back of your mind too. You're like, because there's so many things that you could do short term, mm-hmm. but then you you gotta play the long game. Yeah. It's, otherwise, everything's gonna come crashing down. And and like that's what like the guy you're talking about. Like I've met a couple guys up here, and they're in their like 60s and 70s, and I'm like, dude, how are you doing that? Because that's to me, that's my mindset with it, and that's why. Another thing that I talk to people about is like create that vision of life you want, create the, like the long term goals. Because I see these guys in their 60s and 70s, and I mean, I feel like my mind and both of our minds, like they're always going, right? They're always going, and you're like looking for something to do because some people might say we have ADD. <laughs> However, I think, you know, even if you have a little ADD, I think it's actually highly beneficial if you yeah. can at least. Put it towards something. You got if you, like if you, you use just it towards focus energy, yeah. like you use it to enter, for energy. But sorry, yeah, I mean, I didn't interrupt you about talking to those guys, but uh, yeah, I think um, I don't know. I guess like talking to 
the older guys that they like to just stay busy and keep doing yeah. stuff too and because they also mm-hmm. do it for the the generational thing mm-hmm. I, I, I'd say being around growing up on Rock Island I see generational wealth like no other like there's people's grandparents or parents that bought real estate and the best time to buy real estate at any point in history is always 20 years ago <laughs> it's always 20 years ago I'd say it's 2020 well it's, yeah. it, it always is because then they're like wait a minute you bought that property for $100,000 in 1970? Yeah. You're like, well, back in 1970, $100,000 was a lot of money. <laughs> like, now people saying, like, I bet you 20 years from now, I was like, you bought that place for $500,000? Yeah. You're like, that was a steal. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I think about, I mean, even the place, because we, when we were in Colorado, I mean, it's, it's different markets. I mean, even, even when we're in Michigan, mm-hmm. like, I mean, this house that I'm in right now, I'm sitting here, I'm like, okay, it's in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan. I'm remodeling it. Even when I got it, I got, so this, right, this is another crazy story. When I got this place for $40,000, they, I added in a construction, like a construction budget and the appraisal brought it to 61,000. And when they gave me the loan, I actually made $5,400 off it. Did I ever tell you that Oh story? yeah, didn't you, you closed, well, why don't you, I, I why closed. Don't you tell the audience? I, so, okay. So. I closed on this property, right? So they appraisal. bought a house. So I bought a house for forty thousand dollars. I asked for an eighteen thousand dollar construction loan. So they built the construction loan in, and then the house. So that brought it to fifty eight thousand. The house appraised for sixty one thousand dollars. They gave me the loan based on the appraisal value. So then I said, okay, well, how much? How much am I going to have to put down? They said. Um, 20%, which is basically like $12,000. So they pulled that out of that $58,000 construction budget, which brought the loan down to like Mm $46,000. Because I only bought it for $40,000, I actually got a check when I closed in this place for $5,400. So I bought a house and you got paid. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> like it's it probably sounds a little fuzzy and people be like how did you do that and the thing is like i don't think that will happen on high dollar stuff because no. like the difference <clears throat> of something appraising at a hundred thousand dollars versus a hundred fifty thousand dollars or you go up to 300 to 400 that's not going to happen but like on like smaller stuff like this they're like it's fifteen thousand bucks. Who cares? You yeah. know, we're not we're not gonna be in hot. But even in certain markets, you can yeah. you can increase that. Like I like my my business partner Tom, who's out in California. He's got he had two. So this is another crazy one. He had a duplex and a fourplex in Omaha, mm-hmm. and he got one for forty thousand dollars and another one I think for like I think they're both oh forty thousand and thirty thousand. Okay, mm-hmm. so he went in. Were they in the ghetto too? They were, <laughs> I don't know if they were in the ghetto, but like they weren't, they were in play, they were in a place where he was able to go in and do some repairs. And I think he put like 20,000 bucks into him. So he was like 60,000 bucks all in. He told me the story of his, of his duplex. He was 60,000 bucks all in. And the bank came to him a year later and said, Hey, that property is actually increased in value a lot. We want to give you a value of that of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So he was like, "You're gonna, you're gonna value this place at one hundred fifty thousand. They're like, "Yeah, if you want to refinance." So he basically did a cash out refinance. They gave him, I think, seventy percent loan to value. So I think it worked out to be like so one hundred five thousand dollars is what he pulled out, something like that. No, it was ninety thousand. Okay. So yeah. he got a ninety thousand dollar loan, made thirty thousand dollars just. By doing, by just so doing his work. None of his own money into it. Yes. Basically, it's $30,000 out of it. Now it's... It's not a loan, but yeah. I mean, to me, that's the conversation around having, like, smart debt. I yeah. like the idea yeah. of smart debt because, you know, if you think about it, the more you get into investing and understanding money, like, credit card debt, you know, it's debts that on on things that aren't going to make you money. That's, I, I think, yeah. bad debt. Yeah. And also... I mean, the whole idea of like paying stuff off, people, when you pay it off, now you have leverage in the bank because you can say like we try paying stuff off for like five years, you know, say 10 years down the road, we start paying stuff off and the next thing you know, it's like, hey Matt, it's a million dollar hotel came up and you're like, well, we have all these paid off to yeah. 70, 30 or 60, 40 or whatever. It's like, we can leverage these. Exactly. You and create then, money. And then you just be like, boom, now we can buy it and leverage it from the properties we own. And yeah. I was like, that's, that's kind of also a thing. Of, I mean, because you're not always going to get the appreciation that 
Tom got. Right. Yeah. So that's sometimes not, gotta, yeah, that's not always going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you just got to pay it off. And then, you know, if you bought for $100,000, five years later, it might be worth 130. Yeah. But if you haven't paid off from 100000 down to 50000 now you can pull out, you know, yeah, some cash and whatnot. Right. But speaking of that, we need to still have the conversation. Yeah, we got to refi. Our Get refi rid of that 6% <laughs> of, our, of our seven, seven unit uh, places. So, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, there's just, it, we've almost like gotten into the weeds of a lot of stuff here, but I think this is just like, it's such the beauty of, of this, uh, of this whole, this whole world of real estate investing, of investing of, and understanding money, understanding the opportunities with it. And I mean, seriously, like I, I, this is, I feel like this kind of goes back to the beginning of our conversation. It's like, well, I love talking. Like I love us talking. We talk on a daily basis because yeah. We can go like this and get in the weeds of stuff. And then what ends up happening is the ideas start coming out. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, we could do this and we could do this and let, let's get into this. Yeah. Like, it's kind of funny because, I mean, we'll disagree on, like, different methodologies on how to do this, how to do that. Yeah. But the thing is, like, we're all going to end up at the same spot. Yeah. You know? And, and dude, like, I, I think about this and I've, I've told people this is, like, with partner, like, you and I are in a partnership you're in a partnership with um, an, um, Matt, the, the yep. other guy who lives. No, Matt. Two Matt's. There's two Matts involved. <laughs> two Matt to partnerships. See. Sometimes I just say I have a partner, Matt, and it simplifies things. And everyone's just like, Jesus, how many you and this Matt guy are pretty. <laughs> I'm like, well, there's two Matts. So, okay, so you're in two partnerships yeah. with, with two Matts. I'm in partnership with, with you and another guy, Tom. Um, so, I, where and I. We also own something on our own. I actually think. When it oh, comes yeah. to tax time, I think this is another subject, too, that I don't think anyone will talk about because yeah. it, it can get them in trouble. Yeah. yeah. But they're like, you, if you, in taxes, if you want to take advantage of tax breaks, you need to own something by yourself. Yeah. Because the last thing you want is to have, have a joint owned property and then you s try to get away with a little more here, a little more there. And, and then, then your tax and, and, your the, and the other guy like what is who is this like yeah. what is this situation yeah. and then like yeah the other guy's just like why why are these not equal on both sides yeah you know yeah. Like, so okay so each of us have something of our own but then we have a partnership um but what i was what i was going to get to i think this is what i've learned so much as i've gone in partnerships and gone down this road is when you have partnerships i feel like and, and we had this like we had this a long conversation about this but to me it's like Finding those partners that have the same values, that have kind of, you know, similar vision mm -hmm. to where you're going, a similar understanding. Because it's easy to hop into a partnership and be like, oh, yeah, let's just do this. Yep. But then, like, six months down the road, you're like, who the hell is this person? Yep. And what, you know, I don't get where they're going. And my friend, John Graves, actually, he he got into a not a great situation with a duplex that he bought with four or five people. And it was a $50,000 piece of property or 45. And things like he's still paying off on student loan debts. And one of the guys was his dad, which yeah. his dad could have bought it with cash. No yeah. problem. And then, uh, so now he's got a couple of guys that he's managing it. So he's making, you know, rents off of 1500 total, like maybe for like 1540 or something like that. Yeah. He takes his 5% for managing it part of the, cause he's also like 25% owner. But now there's like, Two or three of those guys that John was gone for two or three months. Yeah. And one apartment sat empty, and because uh, no other guy wanted to come and pick up the slack, so well, John's manager. Oh boy. And then he's like, "Yeah, but everyone's hurting." And then, so I'm like, "Dude, you gotta buy those guys out because yeah. I go, it's not worth your time and effort to manage something that you're not also owning. Right. Because managing is like, dude, I mean, peanuts. And we got in this conversation last night. I mean, it's back to what we we're talking about. We talk. I mean, almost daily. And then it's it it doesn't even have to be a lengthy conversation, but it's like we're checking in, yeah. and being like, hey, what's you know how's things going with really? properties? Well, like, guess what this dumb thing. Has yeah. <laughs> like it creates lots of funny stories. Yeah. Like n next podcast we do, we'll talk about funny stories. Yeah. We'll oh, get yeah. into the weeds on that. That's another. I mean, it's kind of. I mean, I think it. That's again, kind of like a mindset with it is, like, just situations that have come up. I mean, even yesterday when I was telling you about the the you know um the property we got under contract and what we're going with it and even just funny stories i it's fun it like it provides entertainment yeah. and, it, and it provides you it's and it's kind of like you just talk about stuff but then it just spirals out into like you a learning lesson yeah oh yeah it. 
Yeah, I mean, like somebody told me, I, you know, I mentioned this before that to be successful in real estate, you have to be able to laugh about like getting screwed over on five thousand bucks. Yeah. You know, something dumb happening, and, you're, and then you go talk to your boss. Like, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> this, this idiot. And talking about it makes me feel better because everyone's like, yeah. now everyone's like, oh yeah, like that's a, it's a good that one. But me I, too. I was like, yeah, I had this happened to me. I had this happened to me. It's like, but things like it's all. Uh, I think that's why it's also important to have other income too because now that's a write off too. That's why I think mm-hmm. real estate investors also can laugh about that. It's because they realize like, okay, there's this big hit that I'm taking but it's also going to help with you know tax and whatnot which I mean some people it's like a 30 35% off coupon it's yeah. not a total but it, it softens the blow right you know so okay so back to I was going to kind of jump back to the partnerships like what do you think like what do you think about like with partnerships and like I know like what you're saying like you have yeah you have I think there's all those different partnerships benefits. are only worth it when you're leveling up that's a very important. I think yeah. if you're moving sideways, you can move sideways on your own. You can yeah. you partner up to get to something, and then you're working in here with this other guy, and now you're comfortable. You know all the ins and outs of this, yeah. and you're like, well, now I should just buy things on my own at the same level, and you can be very successful doing that. But the thing is, like, to go to that next step in the unknown, you should probably you take gotta, a partner with you, yeah. just so that way... Because there's some, so many times, like, well, you get tunnel vision done, like, you have a problem, or you have this, or you, have, you get tunnel vision, be like, here's a problem, this is it. And then a partner can be like, well, what do you think about it like this? Yeah. It just that that one second piece of, that one second question That's super is good. what can change, you know, a year's of, you know, returns. Oh, yeah. Or, and, or like, yeah, six months of struggles because yeah. you're just trying to work on it. Yeah. Know. And you're like, dude, that's super good. That's such a, I mean, that's a, again, a huge, like, just topic and idea of itself. Yeah. That's definitely. So All right. So like we've been, we've been going for a while. I want, I wanted to kind of, um, we can, oh, we can, we can, we we can oh, edit this, right? Yeah. Yeah. We can hack her out. All right. We can edit but, this. Time. We so like 40 minutes in. 40 minutes in yeah so dude like we're goes. going along like Just driving along driving it's pretty along. good like this kids are going in the back seat <laughs> <laughs> not now damn <laughs> um so dude i was gonna finish up so why don't we what do we what if we talk about like the the books i mean I'm, i know we're kind of like copying like bare pockets but like let's want to um, talk about books and then i just want to we'll say If you are new or you are Mm. starting out and you go, you know, some you're interested in real estate and you know someone that's successful in real estate and you start talking to them and you start just asking about, hey, when people ask me, like, what's the cash on cash return for your property? Yeah. And then some guy, I go, it's either going to be zero or 100% this year. And he was just like kind of (laughs) taken back by that. He's like, I'm like, well, it's either going to be, we're going to put a bunch of money into it to fix it up or we're just going to milk it for all it's worth and we might get 100% of our money back in the first year Wait, what, then, what he's, how did he instantly go to cash on cash return because he's an idiot <laughs> and, but so many people they, they think they're trying to speak the lingo Yeah. and I think that's what Bigger Pockets has done it gives everyone the lingo Yeah. and it just makes you like when you ask a seasoned real estate investor about like a point of question like that yeah. you'll just see them, their eyes glaze over <laughs> and then they're just funny. like this is a dumb question because who yeah. cares about the returns? Who cares about budgetary this and that? It's like you just gotta. You want to. That's a good dude. That's a super good point. You want to get into like. So anyway, that's what I'm saying. Read books and because you will get more out of one book than you will with the two hour conversation. Because think about just the words that are said in the conversation mm-hmm. versus words that are in a book and that you can reread. Well, even a book gives you. It, it doesn't just get into the, it doesn't, you right, like you can quickly get into like cash and cash return and cap rate and, you know, yeah. you know ROI and, and things like that. None of that stuff matters because it's a crap in, crap out thing. Yeah, but it, you get more kind of a broad understanding when you read those books and you have an understanding of those books. Okay, so what, what do you think, what are the best books that you've, you've read that have kind of expanded this into into where you've gotten so far. I think, I mean, everyone says this too, the the whole, Rich Dad Poor Dad's important because it gets you thinking differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Is thinking differently because everything else will follow. Everything else is just knowledge, but getting yourself to have a different mindset because when I first read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I think I owned like four boats 
and two motorcycles, <laughs> a camper. Um, I had two vehicles. All the toys. The, you know, and it was like a lot of that stuff was like I was flipping it. Yeah. So, some of it I was flipping it just because I was like, I need a hobby. I need to do something outside yeah. of work. And, and but the thing is, like, if I broke even, I, I figured it was worth it because I'm like, well, I just learned stuff and it's worth the time or whatever. But that's such a great but the thing. Is, like, as soon as I read that book, I was like, I need to get rid of everything. Yeah. I was like, I need to. So I sold the boat, sold motorcycles, sold campers, sold everything. It's like, and now then we moved and I'm like well thank god I sold off all that stuff because I would have been a nightmare to move that stuff Dude, I figured it's like, a, it's like an anchor I feel like uh, doing the whole two year plan like fl- live in flips every two years is a great way to keep yourself living at just necessities too yeah which is that's a good point I'm kind of touching on a lot of things but anyway so books okay so Rich Dad Poor Dad Rich Dad Poor Dad and then oh man the thing is like a lot of these motivational books I think uh, they all boil down to the same stuff. So just read whatever. So what would like? What's number two? What do you think number two would be? That... Well, sometimes when I go down this list, it's just the order that I read them in because I think whatever I read them in, they were they, they compounded off each other very well. Okay. You know, so I mean, like the the money book, the Tony Robbins Master oh, Money. Oh, Master Game. That yeah. was a that was a great. That wasn't a real estate book, but that was just a good thing about money to Again, me. Yeah. Another mindset book. There's not too many books out there that have been like super beneficial and just learning about real estate but I think there's I mean I always like so same with me I think the rich dad poor dad again with just understanding where you're at in your mindset about money and same same one the Tony Robbins money master of the game I mean dude that's like a novel it's yeah. like 600 pages if you in the first 300 are kind of fluffy yeah. so I think it's like you gotta take dedication to actually get through it yeah like you gotta and I mean, I study that. I, if you're a student of books and you read books, I, I always recommend that book to people. But it's not an easy read. It's, it's definitely. <clears> I think there's also book. something about books. So I don't think I ever read a book <laughs> until I was probably 23. Yeah. Like I read mandatory things I had to in school, but I didn't even read it when it was mandatory. Oh. I just, just kind of like guessed. You kind of. I like... did. I've done book reports in high school where I didn't even read the book. I read the back of the book, and I was just I wrote I wrote I read a half a page on the back of the book, and then wrote a three page book report. I, I was like, and the thing is, like people will be like, well, I hate reading, I hate doing this and that. And you're like, well, you know, it's necessary evil. And the thing is, like when you're reading something that you're interested in, it doesn't suck. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Because yeah. like I remember, I read thirty page manuals service manuals and fly through them when I was like 15, 16 years old. You totally, I can totally see you and then, But then Wait, like, what are you doing? Mom's like, here, read this book. And I'm like, I remember reading the book Holes. Yeah. And like, and that was like the first book that I kind of read that kind of entertained me. But I'm like, this is just a waste of time. I'm like, all this did was waste my time. And, you know. Some people not? love books and they love like yeah. reading mystery novels. I'm like, that's a complete waste of time. Yeah, like complete waste, waste of time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the whole Harry Potter train, I remember that growing up. It's entertaining. Yeah, it's entertaining. It's you know, entertaining. And, you know, if that's something you enjoy, go for it. I mean, I'm not here to knock it, but I'm just saying. But then again, this, people, this is our philosophy. Everything too. we do has to have a purpose. Yeah. I guess that's probably why we resonate yeah. with each other. I mean, like, very purpose driven towards this stuff. Whether it be working out or yeah, read books or yeah, do whatever we want to do. All right, good stuff. Yeah, good stuff, man. I guess any closing closing comments from the audience? This is this is kind of funny. I mean, having like, dude, there's there's some stuff going on. This is this is good. Yeah, this uh-huh. is good. I think we need we need to do this more often. All right, so how do we how do we do close it? it? Don't don't run that. How do we? Okay, so how do we? Um, don't do it. The stuff can be edited. This is this whole ed- like the editing idea. But the thing is, uh, it is a pain to kind of go back through the footage and be like, okay, what do I want to edit out? So majority of this, I'm just gonna roll with. Yeah. And I might hack off the front part and then just like tack on the end as like a credits. Yeah. Kind of thing. Can we do? Can we do like an official opening? Should we try that? Well, that's why I kind of like stopped and be like, hey, just you know, oh, like two okay. minutes or whatever. I kind of did that. That's kind of like what our opening is gonna be. But if we're gonna do that. We just start with the new. Yeah. So how like, should we finish? Like maybe we can just make a bunch of credits and have the credits rolling across the screen as we're just doing this. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to think. Um. So. 
podcast video number one. Uh, this is definitely uh, good. I, I'll actually right. It's just it's so fun. It's so enjoyable doing this stuff with with people who you resonate and you know as we go forward, um, doing these in the future. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun getting into different subjects and different topics. But uh, yeah, definitely enjoy doing this. And and for the next topic, maybe we'll get into a little bit more of the weeds, the weeds and specific yeah. specific subject. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Matt Troop. Woody Beardsley. Signing off. See you later. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Get back to work. Get back to work. Are we recording? Oh. oh. Don't break it. Say, so hold it good. Atlas. You hear your puppy? You hear the puppy? Are, is it recording? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're just going. I don't know. Let's right? get right into it. That's but what you can the... you can go back and edit it. No, it's illegal. <laughs> um, no, that's what Joe Rogan always does. He's like, whenever a guest comes on, they like sit down and they'll sort of be like, Joe, hey, how are you doing? And he's like, save it for the podcast. Don't say anything. Really? Yeah, because like that's all that's all he goes for is just natural conversation. Yeah, that's good to have good. That's a big thing. It's like just being natural and normal in front of it. Yeah, because like sometimes it's kind of like. Some people, if you put $10,000 in cash in front of them, they just change. Mm. Same thing with camera. Put yes. a camera in front of some people, and they just change. Well, it is. Like, you can you can feel it. Yeah. yeah. And now I've been around it so much that I just don't care anymore. Yeah. Like, you get to a point where you're just like... Well, you're, you're nervously flipping through a book right now. <laughs> <laughs> you're nervous twitch. What did it... Um, I heard this one. Who was that? <clears throat> Did you, when was the last time you gave a presentation, like in front of a group of people? A couple months ago at work, I got thrown underneath the bus, had to jump in and, and do it. I actually got volunteered to do it at a big conference, where there's like 300 people there. And you have to do it? Well, at first I was just like, hey, you know, if we need to do this, and it was like next week, we had like six days. I was like, hey, if we need to do it on something, we can do it on the, the dam removal in Pelston. Yeah. And, you know, that'd be a pretty easy one. And then they're like, great. Sounds like, sounds good. It's got to be 45 minutes long, Woody. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> so, so then, yeah, but me and this other guy, Rich, yeah. we did it together. And it was good because me and him, we could feed off each other. Yeah. You know, there's times, like, when you go through a presentation of something you've never done before, you yeah. know, you kind of fumble and stumble. And... That's what I was thinking about. So I've, uh, so you guys had, you guys did it for 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was when I had the deer on a leash. Remember that picture? I pulled the deer on a leash. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did you, um, how many slides did you have? Way too many. Like how many? Like 100? No, it was about one per minute, more than that, maybe. But no, there's some that were like animated just because it was showing like the drawdown. Yeah. So it was like, there was like 10, I think we had like 60. Yeah. Like 10 or 15 of them were like one second slides. So, so it was about you... one slide per minute. That's okay. what we would shoot for. Like when you're when you're presenting stuff, do you think that? Um, well, I guess here we should probably stop. <laughs> <laughs>